Hi guys, so this is chapter 22. What's going on here? The landing light came on, and there stood Mrs Evans, unfamiliar in a quilted dressing gown and no makeup. She saw Ellie May on the floor and hurried forward, dropping on one knee beside her. She was... Uh, we were... Fliss floundered, seeking words which might make their story credible, while the teacher lifted Ellie May's head onto her lap and checked with hands and eyes for damage. Mrs Marriott appeared in a beige nightie, followed closely by Mr Hepworth in maroon pyjamas. The door of room 10 opened and Mary's sleepy face peered out. Mary Nero, shouted, snapped Mr Hepworth. Get back into bed now! The door closed. He looked at Ellie May, sobbing in Mrs Evans's arms, then at Gary, then at Fliss. What's all this about, Felicity Morgan? What's happened to Ellie May? Sir, she came up again to go in the cupboard. Only it's not a cupboard, look. She pointed and then her heart sank. There was no number on the door. Sir, there was a number, sir. We all saw it. Thirteen. And Ellie May opened it and it opened inwards and inside. She stopped. There was disbelief in the teacher's eyes and the hard glint of anchor. She dashed across the door, twisted the knob and pushed. It was locked. She pulled, but the door didn't move. She turned, pointing. Look at Ellie May's neck, sir. Yes, look at it, said Mrs Evans grimly. She tilted the girl's head to one side and lifted the hair. Ellie May's neck was bruised and scratched. She was fighting, miss. Fighting to get into the room. We had to stop her, miss. That's enough, Mrs Evans glared at Fliss. If Ellie May came up here on her own accord, then she was obviously walking in her sleep. It's quite common among young people, and all you had to do was come down and tell me or one of the other teachers. Instead, it seemed to me that you woke her in a sudden, violent way, and she panicked, as anybody would. You've been silly and irresponsible. There's no more. There'll be, there's to be no more of it. Go to your beds, and in the morning I want, I want, you, I want to know where you, Gary Bozzard, and you, David Trotter, were doing up here on the girls' landing in the middle of the night. Ellie May was helped to her feet and taken away, supported by Mrs Marriott on one side and Mrs Evans on the other. Gary and Trot followed a grim-faced Mr Hepworth downstairs, and Fliss and Lisa were left gazing at each other nonplussed. What can we do? whispered Lisa, almost crying. Nobody believes us. Fliss sighed and shook her head. I don't know, Lisa. I'm too tired and fed up and scared to think. We'll talk in the morning. She crept into bed and jumped when Mary's voice came out of darkness. What happened? Fliss sighed. Nothing, Mary, nothing much. Anyway, I'll tell you tomorrow, all right? Promise? I promise. All right. She expected to lie awake till dawn, but she didn't. She had just time to wonder in a muzzy way what she was going to tell Mary before sleep rolled in like a black tide and bore her away. Chapter 23 Thursday dawned clear and sunny after the rain. Ellie May appeared at breakfast smiling wanly and saying she was feeling much better. Fliss watched her across the dining room and wondered if she remembered anything at all about last night. From the way she was behaving it seemed she did not. Practically everybody had heard something of the disturbance, even the boys on the first floor, and the talk over breakfast was mostly about sleepwalking. Fliss had told Mary that Ellie May had found, been found on the top landing sleepwalking and had reacted badly to being woken up. Trot and Gary, she said, were in trouble because they had done the waking. When Mary asked what the boys were doing on the top landing in the first place, she said they'd seen Ellie May pass the floor and followed her up. It didn't sound too convincing to Fliss, but it got around. Trot and Gary had been interviewed by Mrs Evans before breakfast. When Trot started to tell her what she, he saw as he, as he reached for the door to pull it closed, she cut him off, saying, The door opens outwards, David. And anyway, it was locked. And when Gary said there was a vampire in the hotel, she told him not to be so stupid. If I catch you spreading that story among the other children, she says, a letter will go straight to your parents the minute we get back to school. Do you understand? They were lucky in a way, though. Mrs Evans decided they'd gone to the top floor because they were worried about Ellie May. 
There was absolutely no need for you to worry, she told them. But I can see you were trying to be helpful, so we'll say no more about it. So in spite of the midnight rumpus and against all the odds, the four found themselves back in the favour, free to join in the day's activities. It was to be a busy day and Fliss hoped that this might help her to forget the horrors of the night. This morning they were taking the coach six miles to Robin Hood's Bay, where, according to Mr Hepworth, there was a good beach and quaint narrow streets. At 12 o'clock they would return to Whitby for a fish and chip lunch on the seafront, before being turned loose to do their shopping in the afternoon. Robin Hood's Bay was good. The sun shone all morning and they ran along the sand and played hide and seek up and down the little streets. By the time they piled onto the coach, everybody worked up an appetite and fish and chips sounded just right. When they arrived back in Whitby, the teachers got the children settled on some benches not far from the jetty, and Mr Hepworth chose a boy and a girl to go with him to the chippy. Fliss knew he wouldn't pick her, not after last night, and he didn't. He chose John Phelan and Vicky Holmes, and the three of them went across the road and tagged on the back of the queue. Fliss watched. The service was fast, but the queue didn't get any shorter because people kept joining it. She smiled to herself, wondering what the people behind would say when old Hepworth ordered fish and chips 34 times with salt and vinegar. It took them 10 minutes to get served and come staggering back with armfuls of grease and greasy little packets. Mrs Evans and Mrs Marriott gave out the portions, and everybody sat in the sunshine munching, chatting and throwing scraps to a gang of gulls, which appeared out of nowhere on the scrounge. Gary looked at Fliss. Where are you going first when they turn us loose, Fliss? She shrugged. I don't know. A gift shop, I suppose. I want to get a prezzy for my mum. I'm not, he told her. I'm off round that Dracula experience place we saw the other day. Fliss pulled a face. Haven't you had enough of that sort of thing in real life? I know I have. No, I know what you mean, but this is different, a bit of fun. And anyway, I might find a clue there to the mystery of room 13. Well, you heck. Anyway, I'm not going. It's the last place I want to be. That's because you're a chicken, that's why. Am I, Hummer? Chicken of some daft show after what we've seen at the crow's nest? You must be joking. Come on then, prove it. No way. Like I said, chicken. Naff off, Gary, you div. Chicken. OK, OK, I'll come. And I bet you're more chicken than me anyway. You were scared spitless Tuesday night, I could tell. He scoffed. You were, you mean? The argument might have continued forever if Mrs Evans hadn't called everybody together to speak to them. Fish and chip wrappers had been gathered and t deposited in bins, and the place left tidy as always. Right, this is it, the moment you've all been waiting for. You are free to go off now with your friends and spend what's left of your pocket money. You may go into shops or, if you must, into our amusement arcades, but you must stay on the seafront on this side of the bridge. There's to be no crossing into the old town, and nobody is to go wandering off up the streets leading to the West Cliff. Mrs Marriott, Mr Hepworth and I will be keeping our eyes open, and we don't expect to see anybody charging along the pavement shouting. Remember, there are other here people here besides yourselves, and they don't want to be shoved into the roadway or deafened by children yelling. And please, her, first, her face changed, so that she looks to be in great pain, think before you buy. Seaside shops are full of cheap, tinselly rubbish, which looks tempting but falls apart the minute you breathe on it. They are nice things, good things you can take home to your parents, but you have to look for them. Off you go then. Fliss, Fliss felt like slipping away with Lisa to look in shop windows, but Gary wouldn't let her. Come on, he demanded. You said you weren't chickens, so let's go. Last one there's a plonker. In spite of Gary's taunting, neither Trot nor Lisa came with them. The only ones who agreed to come were Gemma Carlyle and Grant Cooper, who arrived last but offered to break the face of the first, first person who called him a plonker. They paid their 50 pences and went in. The first bit was a sort of shop with mugs, t-shirts and badges for sale. Huh? snorted Gary. I don't call this scary. He bought a badge with a bat on it and they moved into a dark tunnel. This is more like it, said Gemma. As she spoke, there was a blood-curdling scream and something brushed Fliss's cheek. She ducked away with a cry and Grant and Gary laughed at her. They were wading through some sort of smoke or vapour which swirled low down, hiding their feet. In the tunnel walls were windows through which weird scenes could be seen. In one, a, one, a coffin lid was lifted by a ghastly hand. In another, a woman with bloodstained clothing lay on the bed, while a red-eyed vampire leered at her through the window. 
While Lee Fliss gazed at this scene, wishing she was somewhere else, a hand came out of the darkness, shrinking from it. She walked right into another, which grabbed at her throat. She recoiled and started walking faster, wanting only to get to the end of the tunnel and out into the sunlight. But now the floor was moving, and she had to walk fast just to stay where she was. It was like a dream. She wanted to go one way, but her feet were taking her another. Sobbing, she broke into a run, and after a moment, the moving section was behind her. She looked down, and the floor was glass. Under the glass was soil, and in the soil half embedded lay the half rotted heads of corpses. She hurried on, feeling sick, looking straight in front of her, thinking, I shouldn't have come here. I should never have let that idiot Gary persuade me. She was sweating, the screams were getting loud, and there was a sudden gust of wind. She didn't know where the others were, and she didn't care. She rushed along, her face and Hair and face brushed by unseen things. Through her eyes corners she glimpsed spiders and graves and the toothy grims of skeletons. She blundered on and then at, at last she saw a door with a sign on it. Way out. Thank goodness, oh thank goodness. She pushed, it swung open. No sunlight, no darkness. And a standing corpse whose head fell off as if she watched. She swerved and rushed past with her head down, and here was another corpse blocking the way. She swerved again, and it stuck out a pale, bony hand. Sudden anger rose, uh, rose in her against this ridiculous place, and her own stupidity in coming here. Teeth bared, she struck at the hand, but it caught her wrist, and the corpse whispered, Wait, I have to talk to you. She screamed, snatching back her hands. The corpse made a small distressed sound, like the mew of a kitten, and in that instant Fliss recognised it. It wasn't a corpse. It was the old woman in the shelter. It was Mad Sal Hagalith. What? What do you want? Here, back here where there's nobody. The old woman took her wrist again, gently this time, and led her through a gap in the tunnel wall. It was dark and cold and seemed to be a sort of storage space with blankets and trestles and paint cans and a lot of stuff she couldn't quite make out. There was a musty smell. Where's this? She didn't know why she'd allowed herself to be led here. If, I, if she'd resisted, there'd have been nothing the old hag could have done about it. Behind the tunnel, Sal whispered, in the real world. She chuckled wheezily. Folks walk through tunnels all their lives, you know, all their lives gawping in through lighted windows, thinking what they see is real, but it's not. She laughed again. No, it's not. They're in a tunnel see, looking at a show. And all the time, the real world just inches through away through the wall. And now and then, just now and then, somebody finds a hole and goes through and sees what's behind it. And you know what they call that then? The old woman paused and Fliss shook her head. Mad. That's what balmy they're the they're the ones who know what really goes on what it's all made of and they call them mad lock them away some of them i expect they'll come for me one of these days do you know what i'm talking about flesh flesh shook her head again in the dark no not really i'm sorry she wondered where Gemma was and gary and grant out by now probably she wanted to be looked with them Look, I need to go. My friends, I wonder where I am. I need to get out of here. Listen then. You've seen something, haven't you, at the crow's nest? Something strange. And there's a sick child. Yeah, Flissman mur murmured. But how do you know that? I know, because I lived in that place a long time ago, before the Great War. It was East View then, not the crow's, n crow's nest. And I went there when I was a ten, as a scullery maid. It was a grand house then, Turnbull, they called the people who had, it, who had it, Mr and Mrs Turnbull and their little daughter, Margaret. It wasn't a hotel, you understand. It was a house, a private residence. You've seen the Abbey, haven't you? Fliss nodded. Yesterday. She wished the woman would go to, come to the point and let her go, if there was a point. There might not be. That was probably one of the signs of madness. It occurred to her that Sal might be dangerous, and she wondered if she'd find a way back to the tunnel if she had to run. Well, the old woman went on, there was a bit more to it when I was your age, a gateway with a little house. Children kept away from that gateway after dark, I can tell you. Grown-ups too come to that. That's where he was, you see. Where who was? Him. That's in the ground, the crow's nest now. Who's in the crow's nests? Who, who is him? I think you know. Anyway, that's where he was, 
old gatehouse. Folks who knew steered clear, strangers didn't, not always. Now and then someone vanish, drowned, we'd say, fell over the cliff in the dark. We knew better. Anyway, it come 1914 and the Great War. Near Christmas and a German battleship comes and stands off a mile or two and fires on the Coast Guard station. Some of those shells hit the abbey. One gets the gateway and demolishes, demolishes the little house. Doesn't demolish him though. Because there's only way, one way to do that. And you know what that is. Anyway, he's lost his place and so there he is. In the middle of the night seeking another. He's got to find it before first light. And you know why? And out of all those houses in the town, he picks these few, and that's the end of it. End of it? How do you mean? End of it is a place folks can live in peace. Listen, Margaret. Margaret Turnbull, little Meg, the apple of her daddy's eyes. She falls sick. All through that winter, paler and paler, thinner and thinner, calling out in her sleep. Doctors come, specialists, no improvement. Comes a night in early spring and there's ever such a bang and a clatter and they find her at the foot of the stair, unconscious. Seven year old. Doctor says she's been walking in her sleep. Anyway, the little mite recovers, though it's a touch and go for a while. And the minute she's strong enough, Master Turnbull sells up and moves on. And we're all let go. Later we hear the child, child perks up like magic as soon as she's away from that house. And after that, the place stands empty and folk, folks steer clear. Same as they used to with the gatehouse. Somebody comes along and buys it eventually. A stranger, but he has no luck and moves out. Place has kept changing hands ever since. Soldiers were billeted there in the last war and one disappeared. Deserted, says the authorities, or drowned, we say, but it's neither. And now he's got barns or fresh lot practically every week, and he'll be laughing and it's you got to stop his laughter, miss. Me? Fliss peered at old Sal in the gloom. Why me? And anyway, how? Why you? The old woman poked a bony finger into the middle. Because you had the dream, that's why. You know it all, don't you? The gate of fates, the keep of sleep, the room of doom and the bed of dread. You remember? Fliss nodded, shivering. Yeah, her voice was a croak. But how... How do I know? I told you. I can go through the wall, leave the tunnel, see what's really what. And as for how you'll be told, don't ask me who'll tell you because I couldn't explain. Just like you can't explain any of this to your teachers. But believe me, you'll be told. And if you refuse to do it, if you don't do what has to be done, your little fruit friend is doomed together with those who went before her and all who'll follow. Doomed to wander the earth forever. Do you understand what I'm saying, Felicity? You know my name. Oh yes, Felicity. It means happiness. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Well, that's what it means. And if you can be very brave tonight, you'll let happiness back into that sad house and into the hearts of more people than you know. Will you do it, Felicity? Fliss hesitated. The old woman's words were whirling around inside her head. Strange words, a mad woman's words. Yes, self life was a mad all right, no doubt about it, completely out of a tree. And yet she soon knew so many things, the dream and all that stuff in the crow's nest, her name and what it meant. She nodded, biting her lip. Yes. Good. A frail hand fell on the shoulder and squeezed. You'll succeed, Felicity. I know you will. Off you go now. Your friends are worrying. Fliss allowed, allowed old Sal to take her hand and steer her back to the hole in the wall. Two people passed by, laughing to show they weren't even scared. Sal waited till they'd gone by, then whispered. Follow them, they're on their way out. Fliss felt a gentle push in the back. She followed the laughing pair, and when she looked around a moment later, there was nothing to be seen.